Greetings, noble company. Today, we are going to be discussing must-haves for the modern medievalist. These are items that are were used in the Middle Ages. I have reproductions of them, and I use them in both my medieval and my modern life to not only enhance the beauty and utility of my life, but also to live in a more sustainable fashion. So let's jump right in. This item causes all sorts of trouble for me when I travel if I leave it in my carry-on. And honestly, even if I put it in my checked bag, then my checked bag gets inspected because this looks like a bullet on the TSA scanners on those x-ray machines at security points, right? This though, lovely little turret, this tower, is actually a needle case. And this needle case I use both in my medieval life and in my modern life because why have a modern needle case when the medieval one is just is more beautiful than a modern one more durable than a modern one and can be used in both contexts so i don't need to have a separate set of modern sewing equipment and then medieval sewing equipment i just have this adorable little uh, sewing case and this needle case was made by uh, Billy and Charlie's finest pewter wares <laughs> um, They have an online presence. This is a new one. I bought my I have had one though from them for about 18 years and despite being flown around the world around and around and around Moved everywhere dragged hither and yon. It is still in pretty damn good condition In fact, the only thing that's really a little wrong with it is it's slightly dented and it's not shiny anymore I could make it shiny again if I weren't a completely lazy contessa, but I don't like cleaning like I love creating I like putting my energy into creating things. I would rather pay someone else to clean anything <laughs> than for me to have to clean it myself. This particular needle case is a copy of a tin example dated to the 15th century and found in the Netherlands. However, pendant cases in this style have also been found in the mud of the Thames River in London. Mudlarking for the win. And for those interested in other periods and places, fear not. Needle cases stretch back for centuries and cover, well, pretty much any culture that has used needle to form fabric or leather into fashion. For instance, in Scandinavia, needle cases are often found in graves spanning the 8th through 10th centuries, often made of bronze, bone, and even occasionally silver, and sometimes containing iron needles. Vikings do love to be fancy and fashionable for their seasonable raids. Ah, I mean, their mercantile expeditions. And in Poland, a plethora of antler needle cases, all shaped like fun fish, have been unearthed dating to the 12th and 13th centuries. Jaunty little fellows, aren't they? These objects seem to not make an appearance in inventories or expense accounts, possibly because they were not deemed sufficiently valuable to merit an entry on the expensive parchment. Materials run the gamut, including a variety of metal alloys, bone, antler, and leather. The surviving pieces all seem to be rather decorative in nature, but that could be a bias in the sort of items that would be likely to survive the centuries. Fascinatingly, in the case of this gorgeous medieval item from the Coriol dynasty, we have a surviving example of a thread bobbin combined with a needle case. Featuring a hollow center to house needles, the bobbin is stored in the case, which in turn protects the thread while keeping the needles secure. I have not personally found evidence of this specific pairing in the case of medieval or Renaissance European bobbins and needle cases. So, if you have any evidence of this clever arrangement in pre-modern Europe, please do let me know in the comments. Cheap plug for engagement. Anyway, needle case for a medieval and modern purposes. Moving along, this is a comb. <laughs> it's a medieval comb though. I use this on my hair modernly. I don't need to have a separate comb for my medieval hair and a separate comb for my modern hair. This does everything I need. It's made of wood. It has uh, large tines on one side for getting the initial knots out, and then small tines on the other side, which are very useful for distributing the natural oils in your hair and from the sebum from your scalp down through your hair and keeping your hair quite lovely. Also, if you, you know, happen to have lice, then you already have a like, built-in lice comb, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. This style of comb has existed for centuries, centuries upon centuries, so it's pretty pan-European, I can't think of any century where I haven't seen some extant version dredged up from a grave or the mud that looks like this. You can get them out of wood. Historically, the really nice ones, of course, were made out of ivory <laughs> or, or 
bone. It didn't necessarily have to be elephant ivory. It could just be carved out of bone. So if you know someone who can do bone carving, then I, and you, you have the, the, the funds to pay them. Otherwise, wood, you can find them online sometimes. Wooden medieval two-sided comb and see what comes up. I found this at a merchant at Penzik. Mm, what year is it? 15 years ago. I actually bought a bunch and I occasionally give them out as thank you gifts for people or just as a nice gift for people whom I admire. In fact, combs were apparently an object of choice as love tokens in the game of Fan Amour or courtly love as the Victorians called it. Andreas Capellanus mentioned them specifically in his 1180 treatise on the subject, saying, A lover may freely accept from her beloved these things, a handkerchief, a hairband, a circlet of gold or silver, a brooch for the breast, a mirror, a belt, a purse, a lace for clothes, a comb, sleeves, gloves, a ring, a box, a keepsake of the lover, and to speak more generally, a lady can accept from her love whatever small gift may be useful in the care of her person, or may look charming, or may remind her of her lover, providing, however, that in accepting the gift it is clear that she is acting quite without avarice. Note that a lover in this context is decidedly a not a spouse. Despite being a man of the cloth, Andrew had some rather oh, liberal ideas on love that were basically precluded by the state of marriage, i.e. Husband and wife could not be lovers because theirs was a legal arrangement of dynastic preservation, meaning baby production, not very romantic. Anyway, this gift-giving practice seems to have continued until the 16th century, with plenty of extant examples of combs that are unsubtle in their intention. In terms of types of wood, they were usually carved of boxwood because this is one of the few woods available that were hard enough to saw out the minuscule tines required to both best remove knits and also distribute the natural oils most evenly through the hair. Next item, let's talk about a little bit more about storage. So, <laughs> the modern world, we have uh, so much stuff. So very much stuff. And honestly, having read inventories of entire households, for example, the household of Lorenzo de' Medici, the, the inventory that was taken upon his death in 1494, he had a lot of crap too. Talk about a rich hoarder. My God, every room, trunks jam-packed with crap. <laughs> expensive, expensive, super valuable crap for the most part, but still. So the idea of needing to find elegant storage solutions is not new. So let's look at some medieval storage solutions that could beautify your modern home and also just go with you when you haul yourself off to a medievalist event. The first item we have is actually an oval basket. You know, the lid actually fits pretty firmly on. <laughs> when I travel, I actually use some of that finger loop braiding to just tie around it and secure it <laughs> um, to keep the lid on. And this is the, I use this specifically as my travel medievalist toiletry kit. So because my little, my little jars fit perfectly in here, lid on, and then at my setup, I have this instead of red or green or blue or whatever nylon bag filled with toiletries. And then when I take the lid off, all I see inside is spilt. Oops, I should have covered that back up. <laughs> is spilt <laughs> asafoetida. <laughs> That's going to make this smell extra fresh. <laughs> okay, anyway, when I remove the lid, inside all I see are lovely medieval jars instead of glaringly modern containers for toothpaste and sunblock. So the reason this is my travel one is because it's flexible and squishy and doesn't weigh very much. To attend most medievalist events, I have to get on a plane. <laughs> um, that means it needs to not take up too much room in my luggage, also it needs to not weigh too much, and it needs to be something that even the gorillas would have a hard time damaging. I think those of you who travel know whereof I speak. Okay, so that's the basket. This, though, is a bentwood box. I have had this bentwood box for 21 years, 22 years, basically. Bentwood boxes have been made and utilized for storage for centuries upon centuries. The earliest, the earliest 
evidence I think I found was an Iron Age find. And you can see Bentwood boxes all throughout the centuries in varying levels of decoration or plainness. So the Italians, for instance, made really elaborate ones. Um, and often with the elaborate ones, the second you paint them, they would gesso them or and or cover them in leather and then paint that because then the paint actually stays. If you just paint straight on wood, the paint's going to chip off easily and quickly. So basically the gesso and or the leather and or the fabric that they would use to cover the wood, it, it acts like paint glue and allows the paint to stay on for centuries, which is why we have all of these amazing boxes that are painted still to this day in beautiful colors and beautiful motifs. So this particular Bentwood box, which is very innocuous, and actually it seems that in the visual record, if you head um, further north in Europe, France, Burgundy, England, and you start looking at the illuminations there, you see mostly these Bentwood boxes are plain. They're, they're, very, they're very modest. That could, however, be because the, the paintings that are depicting them tend to be of religious scenes where modesty is the height of, is, is the order of the day, so to say. So for example, the birth of the Virgin, the birth of Christ, the birth of John the Baptist, the Annunciation, right? All of these scenes in which modest uh, female virtue is being sort of um, celebrated, if not outright pushed, then that you see these, these boxes are there. And often they're open and there's sewing supplies in them. There's thread, there's yarn, there's scissors. So definitely an authentic way to store your sewing supplies. And in fact, this particular box stores my medieval and modern sewing supplies. Cause honestly, I don't really, there's not a huge difference. The only really modern thing in here is this measuring tape, which is made of plastic. Shh, sorry, it's plastic, I apologize. Maybe I'll see if I can have one made out of leather or something like that. This one has also been hosted, has been hauled from pillar to post for 22 years in my luggage being tossed around by angry luggage gorillas. At least they must be angry and they must be gorillas considering the state in which my luggage has often come back to me. Anyway, this is a kind of a cheater version of a Bentwood box um, in the sense of that it's laminated wood instead of just sort of one single piece of wood, but it is real wood. It's not, it's not press board or chipped board and it was probably made in China. Shh, I'm not usually a supporter of that sort of thing, but I've had it for so long. However, if you're lucky and you go to a thrift store in either Europe or the US, you might be able to find a real Bentwood box like this with absolutely stunning workmanship. And we actually got this for a song. This is a real shaker, handmade shaker Bentwood box, and we got it for $20. These things often sell for $100 or more because they really represent serious craftsmanship. So if you're lucky, you check out your thrift stores, the antique store, secondhand markets, you might be able to get a Bentwood box like this. And then if you want, you can gesso it and paint it, covered in leather, decorate it however you will, and pretty much for anywhere in Europe from, you know, first millennium all the way up to the 17th century, including the 17th century. And this is an authentic method of storage. And again, modern to medieval. Actually what's in here now are my modern embroidery supplies for my creative Contessa embroidery classes. Perfect size for these cones, these cones of, of DMC embroidery floss. So, you know, if I need something more storage for my medieval encampment, then I'll just dump out <laughs> these cones and take it with me to the event. But in the meanwhile, this serves as a perfectly good method of modern storage. Well, fellow medievalists, do you have any medieval must-haves that can also serve a modern function? Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, on the next exciting episode, we will explore further storage options and their sometimes disturbing history. We will delve into a clever medieval way to disguise your wax tablets, aka devices, and we will come through several medieval options for refrigerating your comestibles. Otherwise, until next time, stay creative and stay tuned for your moment of kitty zen.